over there, over there. Kemal Gallery is an absolute institution in the city. And anybody who has anything to do with the art scene here will have passed through this gallery at some point or the other, in fact, very often. Uh, and I, my association with this gallery has been since the time of Shirin's parents, Koshir and Keku. And I showed my work several times there. And I've seen my friends showing their work there. And then subsequently after that, we showed with Shirin. Uh, it, <coughs> it is an extraordinary institution. And um, there could be nobody better than Jerry to have recorded this. And I'm sure Jerry has also recorded, uh, what shall I say, the extracurricular activities of the gallery, which have been plentiful. and. Uh, and quite provocative very often, <laughs> as you will read. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, really lovely to see a real live audience <laughs> and real live people outside of rectangular screens. Congratulations on your second book of <laughs> the year. <laughs> Good on making the rest of us look really bad for not having multiple books out. Um, of course, I want Jerry to sort of, you know, take the stage and leave us all out of the conversation. But before we do that, <laughs> Shireen, why, why did you want this book to be written by Jerry? And why did you want this book? <clears throat> so, um, well, I think it was, I mean, you know, this is, this, you said Jerry has two books out uh, this year. <laughs> except both books took, I think, 12 years to write. <laughs> so, so, you know, compliments can be slightly... <laughs> I, I think Jerry's done a lot in between, so yeah. there's a lot to commend him for, but this did take a very long time. So, um, Keku, uh, my father died in 2012, and uh, obviously there was a huge, I, don't, I won't say a ripple, there was like Outpouring. the reverberation was uh, quite um, enormous. And, you know... Those days, Facebook was much more kind of, you know, all of us were on it. We would, we would put our things out much more than now, especially when people died, you know. So, um, so it was just, it, the, the feeling was enormous. And, and you know, what you felt uh, was, uh, and, and, uh, and one, you know, there, a lot of funny stories came out. And there was, because my father was a character, you know, he wasn't like, he wasn't the straight and narrow guy. And... Jerry's uh, anecdote was very funny, and I'll leave that for him to say. But uh, that kind of brought, you know, when the family came together, and, you know, at that moment when your father, you know, the tree sort of uh, is suddenly not there, um, it's the time when family really kind of feels, okay, let's do something. So it was that moment of, of you know, let's... let's so that my, my sister made a, was, was, in the, was deciding to make a film... We said, let's do a book. And this is like way back, you know, now mm. it's a long time ago. But that, that moment was very strong at the time. And, um, and that's really how it began. We just said, let's call Jerry and make him write funny things. And let, you know, <laughs> collect anecdotes. <laughs> Nothing about being very serious. And mm. that's how it began, really. Yeah. Mm. Jerry, I, I, of course, I want you to... Tell us the anecdote that you shared on Facebook. But before that, I just want to read a little bit from the book because um, this is about this is something that you wrote about what you felt when you first came to Kimold, right? <laughs> and uh, and it says that uh, I stopped going to the Jahangir Art Gallery. I walked straight upstairs, willing to take my chances with what the Gandhis had up on their walls. And here's a bit that I find very interesting because uh, so Jerry was uh, recording a podcast about this festival, which you should absolutely hear. It's a wonderful interview. And you were talking about the love affair with the city. And, uh, and this, was the, this is the part of the love affair that I'd like to hear more about. I often felt there that I did not know how to be in the presence of art. I had problems of the usual adolescent kind. Was it decadent? Was it bourgeois? Was it a con job? 
when my friends found out, they wanted to know why I was going to galleries. I would sometimes say that it was the air conditioning and the quiet. I would sometimes say it was the art. I think by then I had begun to understand that being in the presence of the disquieting and the discomforting and the sometimes incomprehensible can rewrite your boundaries, but so slowly you don't even notice when you stop wanting to understand, to pass and dissect, and you begin to respond. And later on you say, without quite understanding how it became that way, I think Kimold grew into a space where you had the right to be. Yeah. I, okay. <laughs> Outed. <laughs> I think, uh, can I start with the, with the anecdote? Uh, so, you know, I remember my strong memory of Ke Keku and Khorshid. Uh, Khorshid was the dragon at the entrance. She was the one, she was the woman who sat in Kemold and she looked at everybody who passed with a steely basilisk ga glare. And she was pausing all of us, like, are you buying or are you here just for the air conditioning? That was her, her question, right? And most of the time as a student, you were, not, you were there because, you know, Raza is on the wall or Ram Kumar is on the wall or Hussein is on the wall. I mean, anybody. You just went up to see what was on the walls. And, uh, but later, when I became a journalist, one day I went to the Kemold, and there was Keku, and you know, there was some, some art thing that was happening, and Keku walked in in a, in a temper, and he said, uh, you know, someone has cut down this tree, this fine old tree that used to grow just there at the corner, they've cut down the tree, I want all of you. Now, he said to all these art-going people who were like, you know, in their chiffons and their, just like whatever, their raw silks. and <laughs> All of you must stand up and pledge never to cut a tree. <laughs> so I thought like, I mean, Sarayu though, she rose to her feet and said, you know, okay, I pledge never to cut a tree. <laughs> Everybody pledged. And I thought, you're such a sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a... Like if tomorrow any one of them had to build a house on a farmhouse, a farmhouse, they would cut plenty trees <laughs> and they'd have forgotten about this thing. But Keku still believed that getting people to say this might make a difference, might make a change. Okay? And I think that was what drew everybody to him. Because inside that man, inside the maverick, inside the, the wild man of the gallery, you know, who could walk down to, uh, to Jahangir Art Gallery and buy an entire show. Like, buy the entire show and of rubbish paintings. And he knew they were rubbish, but he said, poor man, he doesn't have money to go home. Let's just buy the paintings. What is there? That's like, inside that fellow was a man of great purity of motive. He was not ever, I think, that whenever I met him, I can't remember a moment when Keku was saying, write about me, or write about my gallery. He was saying write about the city. He was saying write about this issue. He was saying write about the fact that we don't have a national gallery in this city. He was saying write about, uh, about uh, the way they are cutting down trees. He was a man with several missions. What's not to love? And really the reason why I think I agreed when, uh, you know, when the family called me to Keki Manzil and you know we all drank tea and ate biscuits on the sit out and look out looking out onto the Arabian Sea. The reason why I agreed is because not because this was a gallery that and it is a gallery that was very important to the birthing of of modern art in this city, but it was a gallery that refused to be just a gallery. Its creators and its founders, Keku and Khorshid Gandhi, were first citizens of this city. They were first people who cared about, about what was happening. And at each point in time, there they were, inflecting the dialogue, talking, ceaselessly interrupting and disrupting the forces of communal disharmony, of uh, politicization, and insisting on the creation of a, of a <coughs> shared space. That's what I loved about them. That's what I think is, was important. And that needed to be recorded. Mm. And, uh, yeah, you should, uh, when you read this book, you will see that there's a, in early on, you have this beautiful ode to Bombay as a cultural city, which, like, so warmed my heart. Um, but it's also... And it's, yeah, it warmed the heart of a Bengali. <laughs> <laughs> you take all the victories, Jerry, you take them all. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, uh, it's, such a, uh, it's such a loving ode. Like, it, it's, it's the kind of... Um, 
it's a kind of loving analysis that I think only a lover can make of a place. Mm. And what, and the thing was that at that point I was like, yeah, Bo Jerry will obviously love Bombay. But it's what you've done in the book is that, you know, it almost feels like Eko and Koshe, they're sort of reflecting facets of the city itself, you know, the eccentricities, the maverick quality, this idea of the city being a city of dreams, but alongside you have Koshe's patience and the pragmatism and all of that which goes into making this city work. Um, for you, what were you uh, were you thinking right from the beginning that this would be a portrait of a city as well as uh, Kimold and uh, the two of them? Was that clear for you right from the beginning, or was that through the process of research? No, you know. Uh, first of all, I think when I started writing it, I have to say this: the Gandhi family was extraordinary in throughout the process. Okay, there was not a file that was closed. There was not a diary that I could not look at. There were no letters that were concealed or anything. I was just, I sat in that house alone. Uh, un, like, I mean, you're leaving a writer <laughs> you know, to read your mom's diary. quite a mess of the archive, <laughs> I have to say, in the meanwhile. <laughs> I was going to ask you how things were after Jerry we was done with that. it. <laughs> no. So I think the uh, the... Uh, the fundamental thing was that I, I could see everything, right? I was mm. allowed to see everything and everybody talked to me with no barriers at all. So actually, I did the filtering. They didn't do the filtering. I did the filtering because of what I thought I was going to, I was doing. So at the beginning, it was actually the Keku Nama. Mm. It was the story of Keku Gandhi. I, half, a little into the book, I was in the, in the house and Khorshid was a wonderful... I, I really I got to know Karsha through the process of this book which was so lovely because she would wheel herself in her wheelchair into the room where I was working and if I looked up and smiled and started chatting she would stay but if I was I, I was working she would turn and wheel out again she was a self-contained woman who even in her her last months was not going to be needy she was not going to be like you know someone who demanded your time and said talk to me talk to me and once I said, you know, she said, what are you doing when I was sitting there? And I said, I'm writing a book about uh, the gallery uh, uh, Keku built. She said, what Keku? I did the work. <laughs> and Which then, incidentally, sorry to interrupt you, but many, many years ago, there was, uh, there was some reason that I was talking to Shireen for one article or the other. And, uh, and I mentioned the same thing that, you know, your dad's gallery. And she was like, it's not my dad's gallery. <laughs> My mother's the reason it's here. <laughs> you <know? laughs> totally, you know, I have the feeling that if if Keku had been making doing this gallery alone, it would have run for about six months. <laughs> okay? And those six months would have been joy. They would have been delight and they would have been madness. Because he would have double booked the gallery. There would have been several <laughs> people saying, but you said next show is mine. I mean, you know, Stella needs photographs. Stella Sneed... Uh, ate her own snot as a child. I don't know why I know this, <laughs> but your your father told me this also. Uh, you know, so uh, Stella Sneed was a, a, a painter who lived in Bombay in Varsova, and she took pictures of the patterns that sand crabs made in the in the sand. And Keku said, "We will have a show." Korshit <laughs> said, "Who will buy these pictures?" And Keku said, "Why are you always bothered about who will buy? Who will buy? Let us show them no first. No one bought them." <laughs> but still, it, that was how the gallery would have run. Okay, But Khorshad, when I started reading the archive, the letters, I found, and this is, remember, this is the time before email, before WhatsApp and all of it. So if you were Raza, sitting in Gobbio in France, you wanted to talk to your gallerist, you wrote a letter by hand. Okay, And you sent it. I was touching Raza's letters. I was touching Atul Dodia's letters from Paris. Okay, just like reading all of this and thinking, I want to put them in my shirt and take them home and sell them on eBay tomorrow. But of course, one doesn't do that. Anyway, I, I enjoyed reading all these letters, but everybody was writing to Khorshad. Mm. They were not writing to Keku. They were writing to Khorshad and saying, love to Keku, huh? Love to <laughs> <laughs> Tell him we love him. <laughs> but you do the work, huh? Because otherwise this show won't happen. <laughs> okay. The only, uh, there were few <coughs> elements of Keku's writing that I found, except one joyous, joyous thing in a, in a, um, in a receipt book, okay? 
And now that is the reason why you must read everything, including the receipt books. Painting fell off taxi and is lost. Please do not charge. <laughs> No, it, it was, do we know who's painting this? Yeah. No, 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 no. It was Bupen Khakkar. Bupen Khakkar painting. So now this is like the story <laughs> for a OTT film, The Missing Bupen. <laughs> Where did it go? Okay. I just It rolled off the carrier. <laughs> <laughs> Who loses a Bupen Khakkar? The family that lost an MF Hussein for two weeks. And that's the Which is a great story. story. Thank you so much. Which is a great story. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, by the way, this is there's a Raza letter in the book, huh. and I fully admire the handwriting for like 15 minutes. Um, yeah. These yeah. are the small joys. And see this, you look at the signature. Signature. The signature yeah. is a bit of calligraphy also. Zat 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 zat. So, it, it, given that everyone had a Keku story, and Koshid were were letters, uh, mm. and you got to. You got to speak to her quite a bit. Like, you've got this beautiful quote, which, again, I, this one, I don't remember the page, but I have it noted down. Oh, wait, I will find it. We are made to love what we have, or how would we love our husbands? <laughs> really? She said what that to a me. a line. Yeah, really. Uh, did <laughs> I, you know, I was talking to her about, uh, about him. There's one thing about dealing with the family also. That at one point I asked, uh, I asked um, Rashna, your sister, I said, do you think Keku was bipolar? She looked at me and said, there's any doubt? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I'm dealing with Gandhis. <laughs> Why am I asking these questions? There were, there were such complete transparency. And again, you know, when, uh, when uh, Keku and uh, Karshid and I were sitting there and talking, she told me about how much she hated him. Mm. She told me how much she loved him. Mm. She told me about both sides of the story. You know, and with complete frankness. So I think there was a great, in Khorshid especially, there was a great se self-containment. She had worked very hard on herself. She had worked very hard on her singing. Her singing led her to a spirituality, a spiritual place. That spiritual <laughs> place had led her to... to a, a, a very strong self-reflection. Right? And I believe that self-awareness is a very limited phenomenon. Very few people are actually aware of themselves. Korshid was clearly aware of who she was. Mm. And that was such a rare and beautiful thing that I really regretted it that, you know, I got to know her so late. So late. Because it was always Keku. As long as Keku was around, he just like sucked the oxygen out of the room. Right? Yeah. And even if I was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> so, Shireen, what was it like being interviewed by Jerry for this book? And did it make you see Keku and Korsha differently? Um, no, I mean, I think Jerry has said already a lot that, you know, um, <laughs> just in terms of the fact that, you know, you have this person coming in mm -hmm. and making dates with different people at different times. Not everyone lives in that house because, you know, they're also transient. Some sister lives in London. One is in between Alibag and Switzerland. <coughs> Adil is, of course, there. And, Sweetie uh, Adil. Adil! Yay! Clap for him. <laughs> Where is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> Are, come on, give him a round of applause. <laughs> 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 so, so, um, so, it was kind of, you know, something that he did and he made days and and... Um, speaking, I mean, you know, because Jerry's a kind of, of course, we've known him for a long time, maybe not as intimately as one has in the last few years, but, you know, Jerry was uh, p very much part of our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't, I don't know, but I, it's, a, it's also, don't forget, you're asking me a question that I did, like, you know, I answered many, many years ago. Yeah, fair enough. But um, I think it was, I, I, I really enjoyed bringing the whole thing out. Mm. I mean, of course, he, he, is, he has a journalist in him that without asking too much, you're kind of spilling it all out. But also, you know, you're writing a book. Uh, I mean, actually, the other day I was reading just a small part of it. And I said, ooh, I said this, you know. And I was telling my friend Roshni Vadera mm. uh, that I've said something about your father. I mean, completely complimenting him, but it was very uncomplimentary to us. Mm. Uh, mm. So I, I realized that we have been quite unfiltered. And I, <laughs> oh, I like think it's seriously. fine, you know. It's, it's good because there are 
stories that are um, that need to be said. You know, yeah. it's fine because you know we didn't collect Tayab Mehta um, uh, because we every painting that we sold counted. Hmm. Whereas Mr. Vadera was buying up hmm. and stocking up and hoarding his work. We couldn't afford it. It was a very different scenario. Hmm. But hmm. Uh, but you know, in doing so, we were much poorer for it as as a gallery. You know, mm, mm. but uh, but I mean, you know, these are just facts that I think historically are interesting that they're now laid out. So, and many such uh, kind of stories. You know. Yeah, uh, and when you're when you're reading about Kemal, it must be a very different experience to sort of read it as an outside chronicle. Uh, or was it like, oh, I know this already and he didn't put in the bits that I should think he should have put uh, in? Also read it, I mean, I have to read it now again as a book because I read it as a manuscript because mm. I was reading it, I read it, I think, twice or thrice and mm. the first time I just... Like, Raced I was, through it. I loved it. No, yeah. And I was just making notes. The second time, it was more during lockdown and I got, I don't know, I just was very resistant to it. Ah, I think at that point okay. I was like, oh God, this is a... You know, this is like, I don't want to read about ourselves, you know, or, or myself or the gallery. Mm. And it, there was this kind of sense of like, I had, I did have a resistance to it. And it took a long time before I could, I really, really, I didn't, I, I went so slowly because there was this kind of sense of, you know, I, I don't want to read about myself. So what made you feel comfortable with it eventually? Uh, and then the third time when it was, when I think lockdown was, <laughs> I think we were all in a strange Lockdown space. was a strange time. Yeah, and and then uh, you know he again went through edits and mm. yeah. and then when and there was very unnecessary things sometimes. You know, mm. I was like Jerry, you haven't interviewed Vivan and Gita. You know, like how can you have a book without them? And so he interviewed them, and there was like Vivan had given his bio data. I was like, why is his bio data in the book? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Was taken out. See, they took I that note. He took that note. When I'm saying unfiltered, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, must we go there, man? Vivan and Gita are both frightening. No, no. So, so I'm just saying, you know, there was there was some. I, I guess it also took him so long. There was moments where you're yeah, like, okay, let's get done with it. You know, it's also like, the, how many people have you? You're very methodical about these things. How many people See, did you speak I to? I interviewed like about uh, uh, totally. I interviewed about 112, but only about 62 got into the book. Only. Yeah, because you know, very often people say things that okay, we in India we. You know, when you're, when, if you're ever talking about someone, tell me a story. Yeah. Don't give me an adjective. I but, liked him. Yeah, he was a very sweet man. He was a simple person. And, you know, <laughs> we believe that simple person is our best compliment. <laughs> Kekku Gandhi was by no means a simple person. But they will say simple person and then look to see if you've written it down. <laughs> so you say, okay, simple person, you write that, you know. And then they feel happy. Now, simple person is written down. So, I, where I got stories, and again, see, you know, when she said, let's just do the funny stories, I didn't want to do the funny stories. You haven't. There's no, a no, lot that's you. quite dark and serious in her. Because well. what I felt was the funny stories were actually obliterating the fact that Keku did a hell of a lot for the city. Mm -hmm. Right? When the riots broke in 1992, he was manning the phones every day. Mm. Calling the police, calling the Shiv Sena, calling the governor, calling the uh, police again, calling the army, calling Delhi, calling whoever he could. Uh, please were coming in, sir, please do this, sir, please help me. He was on the phone doing that. Don't tell me funny stories about a man who will put himself out there during the riots. I don't think funny stories are about this guy. Okay. Single hand, okay, there was Pilu Pochkhanawala, whom we've all forgotten. I want to do a book on Pilu Pochkhanawala. We're talking about that later. Pilu Pochkhanawala thought we you should have a nat national gallery of modern art in this city. Yeah. When she died, her cousin in law, Keku, took over that battle single handedly and he fought it on every level. Mm -hmm. He went to the family. He got the family to give the the, uh, the building to the government. He went to the government. He got the government to accept it. He went to the central government. He got the central government to allow NGMA. He went. He asked for the paintings. He got the paintings together. He started writing to all the people who had bought 
the progressives when they were in India and were now back living abroad and said, please give me paintings for this gallery. The man worked his butt off. Mm, mm. And we are talking about him as if he's a funny fellow. And this is the Parsi thing, yeah. <laughs> if the person is funny, then... Oh, I, think, I mean, it started like that. It yeah, started like that. No, no, I didn't I know. say that it had to be a funny book. No, no, no. I know. <laughs> I'm saying back I, also, I would have loved to do a funny book because there is nothing better than making people laugh. I love making people laugh. But when you see such solid achievement, you think this is a hero of the city. Yeah. How come we don't have a, even a plaque in the NGMA that said he fought to make this space available? And after that, man, Dipanjana, we saw Picasso, right? Yeah. In Bombay. We yeah. saw that Voyahad connection in Bombay. We saw so many wonderful and magi magical shows. Because Keku cared. Mm. And did he want to become the director of the NGMA? No. Nah. He just wanted to be there sitting around and telling people what to do. Okay? <laughs> like, you know, like, ah, we should do that. I mean, he went, like, you know, when we'd come from Bandra, yeah. we'd sort of pass NGMA. Every single day, he'd first get off there and have his meeting with Saryu Doshi mm. before he came to the gallery. Not that he had work at the gallery, his work was there. So that was, yeah. I mean, you know, Saryu's memory is very strong on that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she talked yeah. to me about it and it was a lovely moment because she tell, she also was very unfiltered. Yeah. She told me that he was very unhappy with her as a choice of the first gallery director of the NGMA. But in a few months time, he was like on board. He See, he could change his mind. Mm. That's also a really important thing. And all this was made possible. All of his interventions in the larger world were made possible because... His wife was there solidly, like, I mean, planted. And, you know, uh, Rashna says a lovely thing where she says, like, he was like our mother, mm. you know? Like, mm. I mean, he would come and massage our feet and talk to us about the day and ask us what, what it was like and share things with us. And their mother was, like, setting boundaries <laughs> and, you know, and telling them how, they, how she the should write a letter. <laughs> <laughs> so joyous. Wonderful. Uh, Darling Shiroon, <laughs> when you write a letter... You start by writing nicely, then you write bigger and bigger, <laughs> then you finally at the end put one big heart in a circle. You are just wasting things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the other side. Okay? These are the other letters from boarding school. Huh? So yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Every yeah. week you have to write a letter <laughs> and like, hello, how are you? I'm fine. What I can imagine. But the other side of that letter writing of Keku, of uh, Korshid, right? Uh, so the emergency happens and uh, and M.F. Hussain paints Indira Gandhi as as India. Durga. As Durga. Okay? As the giver of all good things. Khorshid is really angry at this. <clears throat> now Khorshid knows the economics of the gallery more than anybody else. <clears throat> she knows that if any if anyone can have a sellout show, it can it is MF Hussain. But this is a principle. And she will not sacrifice commerce to principles. And so she writes him a letter. And she says, Dear Hussain, you have painted Indira Gandhi as Durga. That is your right. But uh, that is your right because you have freedom of expression in this case. I have a problem with you doing this because my freedom of expression has been taken from me. I hope you understand this. And I thought, like, I mean, you know, she's actually taking an axe to her own tree. She's actually hurting this relationship. Because artists are peculiar big people. No more peculiar or less peculiar than writers. But the I'm peculiar. saying. Yeah, yeah. the peculiar. So you, you, you offend an artist at your own risk, right? But she did write that letter. And I think that's the central thing. That letter writing principle... And the fact that those letters were available, yeah. Just such a yeah, lovely thing. That you have so it gods. kept. Yeah. Um, but and it's then you make a mess, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. You made a mess, you made. <laughs> you. <laughs> Let's not point in that direction while saying but that this. That mess has been now <laughs> rectified. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what you were saying just now, I was thinking that that was one of the things that I was uh, thinking about while reading the book, that we talk, you know, there are terms that we tend to throw around quite a lot these days. One of them is privilege. And this, was a, this is a great study of what it is to have privilege and to use it well. Like the amount of, like for example, I love that story. There's a story in which uh, Keko and Khorshed are waiting for a flight at Santa Cruz Airport. <laughs> and who should also be going on a flight from Santa Cruz Airport except Pandit Nehru. And Khorshed says, oh, I have a letter for you here. <laughs> <laughs> and 
<laughs> and Jerry's reaction to that is, you really did that. And her reaction is, what's so really, really about it? That's a great line in itself. But like, what's so really, really about it is what I want on a t-shirt. But yes. Um, but you know, it's the, it's the access, right? That you can walk up to Pandit Nehru and hand over a letter. But that also means that that access does not come without work. And that work has gone in, like you were saying, at every stage. Um, the understanding of what you do with your privilege, that it has a role to play in the city and the civics around you. That's something that I think comes out so much. And it also, we tend to think, particularly with the contemporary art, we tend to think that it's sort of removed from the main dialogues of the city, right? It's in a gallery. It's in an enclosed, in that white box or that black box kind of a space. Uh, this is work that sort of reminds you that at every stage, this, these buildings are literally built, they are the foundations of the city and of the ethos that we associate with the city. Um, for you, you've also, I mean, you've written about art in the past, you've been sort of, you know, in, the, in this world for a very long time as a journalist, as just a watcher, as an enthusiast in different ways. Was there any part in the process of writing this and researching this that brought you in touch with things that surprised you or that made you sort of, you know, think that, oh, I hadn't thought of this? Almost everything, you know, because what you, when you walk into a gallery, what are you? You're, uh, you're like one half, like one, I don't know, like one cheap judge. Like you walk in and you say, okay. Like the other day. <laughs> <laughs> filter Anyway, so uh, you, you walk in and... So you I shouldn't your... ask you what you think. I uh, never mind. Uh, well, you know, you walk in and you do your judgment call, right? Mm. Your judgment call is actually based, I think, on how much time you will spend in the gallery. So if you come and you do a... But, you know, parikrama and you're out of the door, then you have already dismissed it. But if you come and you spend time, you come back again. Those are the times when uh, a and, uh, and, uh, show has really touched you. But you're never thinking about what goes behind it. Mm. You'll read the wall text and say, Ha, Nancy ne likha hai abhi. <laughs> Bohut likha <chan. laughs> And you walk past it. Oh, you read it or whatever. Yeah. But you're not thinking about who painted it. How did it get painted? When did that come in? When did the paintings come in? Were they uh, were they kind of mounted here? How will they be taken away? Are there police there? It's like so much that goes into the making of a of anything. Mm. And this mechanics in a good gallery is invisible. It must be invisible. Otherwise, you don't want to see a film in which a spot boy shows up and says, "Hey, hey either light hai. You, know? you want the spot boy does his job in the background. So. All the work of the gal in a gallery is literally invisibilized. It is made invisible as it should be. And it is again and again and again and again. Show after show after show after ego after ego after ego coming in and out of the door. First the artist's ego, then the buyer's ego, then the critic's ego, then the, the average Johnny on the road who's empowered to come in and do his little ego nonsense right mm, there's mm. just this display of egos and the gallerist has to be that still center around which the whole this whole slightly weird right it is slightly weird and it is only slightly weird because there's money involved if there were no money involved it would be lovely and natural right because art is what everybody does and everybody makes but when you come into an art gallery and you say that this thing is, whatever thing it is, is worth 12 lakhs. Then immediately the bean counter in your head starts thinking, what is 12 lakhs? How much am I earning? <laughs> I'm earning like this will take two years for me. You, all kinds of stupid thoughts are starting in your head just based on that money thing. Hmm. right? So all these nuances actually, you will never begin to think about until you're writing a book about a gallery. Hmm. But I, as I said, I would not write a book about a gallery. I'm not... I have off, I said that that gallery became a space where I could be. It was woomby, it was enclosed, it was quiet, it had some fabulous art on the walls, you could spend time there, it was nicely air-conditioned, Elphinstone College toilets were really bad, but you paid one rupee and you could go to the Jangir Art Gallery toilet. All that was there. It was in place, then Samovar was there. It was really like mm -hmm. an ecosystem, right? 
Anatesan's next door. You could just peek in and see a, you know, a Gupta period bronze. It's like, what? Yeah. Okay, it was yeah. lovely. Yeah. But if the gallery had not been a citizen gallery, it mm. would not have held my attention over over a period of time. I would, I would maybe write, be able to write an article, mm. but I wouldn't be able to write a book. But because this was a gallery that put itself out into the public sphere, right? That's <coughs> what I felt was important. Mm. And that these people inflected the discourse in the city. Mm. Right? Mm. Gif Patel, who, uh, who uh, was here, he and Keku fought a little battle with the Jahangir Art Gallery people who were hiring out the Jahangir Art Gallery for weddings. Weddings, yeah. Yeah? I mean, they decided what would... Who's, everyone else would have said, whose father what goes? You know, like, what does your father do? They are doing weddings. But it's not their space, hmm. but it is art. And we need to take a stand. Jyotindra Jain told me that when uh, his, uh, his, uh, his show was, uh, was being uh, brought down by the police, Keku, Keku came and stood by him. That was the kind of thing that they did. Yeah. And that, I thought, was needed to be recorded. Yeah, absolutely. And in any case, like we have so few good local histories of yeah, uh, contemporary yeah, Bombay, yeah. like too few. Um, Shireen, I'm wondering, when you're listening to Jerry sort of talk about the role of the gallery and the way he sees the gallery function, for you, what is the role of a gallerist? Oh, that's <laughs> a three-hour lecture. <laughs> Compress a little bit. <laughs> um, what is the role? Um, first of all, I think we are... Uh, culture makers, taste makers, we are a sort of, you know, the, uh, I, I mean, how much I can dictate, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I do, we do set a certain standard yeah. of what um, we would like to put out there. I mean, what you, you know, you can throw something, but whether you catch it is not, uh, you know, it's not in your hands. Hmm. So I see myself as somebody who, who in some sense puts that out into, mm -hmm. uh, into the city, into the country, you know, we do things outside of Bombay. Uh, so, so I do, I mean, you know, so those standards are set by the kind of artists that we select. Yeah. And uh, so we have, you know, it, it, it's like, so my, I also see myself as a marriage partner hmm. to many, many people. Uh, and those are my different artists, you know, hmm. so, hmm. and the different relationships with each of them, you know, some of them uh, have, uh, they suck you. Some of them are much more accommodating. Some, yeah. you know, so they're, they're very different kind of relationships. Mm. And, uh, you know, like, who's your favorite? I can never, that's very difficult. Because each time, you know, that, that baby who's there yeah. becomes your favorite till another one comes. So there are, so it's very much relationship based. Mm -hmm. and, and you know and what you should do? Mm. When you go, go walk into Kemolda, you have to go and open Shireen's door. And you say, what is this show? <laughs> and Shireen, immediately, you don't like it. Come on, let me show you. And we'll immediately take you around the whole show, explain. You know, yep. and, and, so I just like, each time the show goes up, I go and open the door and say, what have you put up? And Shireen immediately searches out like a mummy trying to explain. what like. A, and you get a great guided tour of the whole show. One day she's going to, okay, now I've told you. Now her, you've so, given yeah, her your yeah, but, tricks but, away. Yeah. <laughs> but it's and, just, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, there's the whole thing with, you know, with the patrons and the clients and the curators and the writers. So, so you know, it's that, as he said, you know, there are all these egos, but there are also these relationships. And these and minds and yeah. hearts and yeah. souls and so creative it, it spirits. Is, yeah. it is, I think it's very, very relationship-based as well. Yeah. So the, the bit that you were saying about uh, the taste-making to some extent, because you're selecting, and of course, you know, uh, again, there's a lovely line, I've forgotten exactly where it is, about uh, where Khorshad says that, you know, the city has changed, so the art must change alongside it. It can't, it can't stay static. That, she says it much better. Mm. Buy the book and read it. It's a much better quote in there. Um, but like, uh, so when I was uh, reading that, but that comes towards the end of the book and much earlier, uh, a little bit earlier on, uh, Jerry, you write about how uh, there were later shows in Prescott Road and uh, that you know K that Keku didn't like, and he would walk by saying shit, shit. <laughs> no, he would write. It oh, he book. would write it. <laughs> like, shit, shit, shit. Because <laughs> let it not be an oral history. We will have a written record <laughs> that the founder of the gallery did not like this show. <laughs> you know. <laughs> when you I mean, he was ninety-two. Yeah. Okay. No, fair yeah. enough. I mean. It, 
I, I feel like he would have said it at any age. <laughs> if he felt like <laughs> Yeah, if he didn't like it, I kind of feel like age isn't the reason he was writing it. But, um, but you know, when you were sort of... So you have charted a very different direction for Kamal, you know, <coughs> in the kind of artists that you're bringing and the kind of art that you show. Yeah. Um, what's that been like? Because there's a different legacy and you have ch changed direction. Yeah. So what's that been like? Um... Yeah, I mean, you know, it was 88 when I came in and about 90 mm. is when, or 91, 92 is when art began to, you know, take a sort of different yeah. turn. And I was very, very friendly with the women who were sort of part of that turn. So, mm. so I was, you know, I was very, very influenced by somebody like Nalini Malani, um, who was taking a, you know, and, and she was... Somebody I was, you know, I was of course in awe of her, but I was also, she was a very good friend. Mm. And, uh, and she was changing her medium. Mm. Um, and Pushpa Mala would be coming and changing. And then Rumana Hussain. So there were a lot of amazing women around me. And I was, uh, you know, looking at, I mean, I, I don't think I was, I didn't know. In some ways, we made some history there. Mm. But at that time, it was just very natural surroundings that, you know, these, these, these people were making, Vivan Sundaram you know, making very, very different work and responding to the political climate mm. of, you know, the Babri Masjid thing. And, you know, I think uh, uh, I, whether, of course, my parents were always in politically involved. At that moment, it became very pertinent to be part of that. So, um, so, so that kind of direction then cha changed the overall direction. And, and you know, it, you, you start looking at art in a different way. Mm. And, you know, by then they are looking at very different art, but I just never felt like they were, uh, you know, it was very kind of natural. There wasn't, you know. There wasn't a break. It, there wasn't a break and there wasn't this kind of questioning. Mm. My father would question me. He did, did, he did like, you know, he said, you're doing different things. I don't understand what you're doing. But, uh, uh, but with my mother, it was always like, you know, a lot of approval seeking. <laughs> So I would be always wondering whether she liked it or not. Not that I would, you know, it wasn't like, oh, mommy, just tell me what you think. It was like, you know, sitting in the background and she would come and, and be and judge in a mm. very, very generous way. And it mattered a lot what mm. she said. If she didn't like something, it would rank her. With my father, it didn't rank her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. So that, I just, can sorry, sort of yeah. just add a little here. Uh, in Keku's world, the political sphere was, was here and the art sphere was here. They were two separate things. And there was some intersection, like, you know, Bhupen painting a nude man and him fighting his battle to keep it up on the walls, or um, Vivan doing the Mrs. G portrait mm. during the emergency. There, was, there were moments. But with Shireen, the overlap became much greater, right? The political and the aesthetic began, began to become... A, Merging. So, Merging. Yeah, a, mer a seamless discourse, right? Mm. And so that often, I think, when I, when I go into into uh, Kemol now, I am surprised if the show does not have mm. some strong political message as well. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in the old days, you went into a show, say, uh, Merli Gobai, Raza. You, you went in and you saw art. Mm. <laughs> and what was happening outside was outside and you would respond to it when you went outside but this was art mm -hmm. now that world those worlds have begun to collide have not been going to collide but they've begun to f to actually in enter into a symbiotic relationship which is very healthy for art i yeah. think yeah, that's yeah. my yeah. yeah no i i think so sorry you were saying yeah, something yeah. no um it, it's just there is though an interesting parallel yeah uh we will be opening up for Q&A in case you were thinking uh, mm. that we will continue like this and not <laughs> let you in. It will happen very soon. Um, no, what I was thinking was that, you know, uh, when you were talking right now, Shireen, you know, about how uh, you felt like, you know, there were these uh, artists and there were movements in the art world that you were witnessing and therefore you kind of brought it into the space the way you understood it best. Um, that's kind of reminiscent of how the gallery also got set up, right? Like mm. there was all of this art happening around and there was Keku saying that, but we need to bring it into this space. So even though he thought shit, shit, um, it, it's kind of the same thing happening yeah. again. Yeah. And yeah. 
that's yeah, and doesn't I'm, fall very does far not fall far from the tree. And, as and, it and turns as I said, you know, it's a, the gallery has always been contemporary in that yeah. sense. You know, yeah. it's never been. I mean, we don't show modern art now, but what is what was modern art was, you know, contemporary at the time. Absolutely. So I think in that sense, it's kind of remained, uh, you know, relevantly now. Yeah. You know, and at any point, it was always now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was uh, so when I was finishing the book and the uh, the 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 written part is followed by uh, extracts, I guess is the right word, right? Extracts from um, both of their own writings. So you hear them in their own words. Uh, and I was finishing and, and it ends so beautifully. Uh, but it was also, <coughs> I found myself remembering what is probably my favorite show at uh, Kemal Prescott Road, which is um, Nilima Sheikh's documenta installation. <coughs> which was called uh, Carrying Forward, Leave Behind. And it's an octagonal space for those who haven't seen it. Uh, it Where was a loss you? because it is one of the most beautiful works I have ever seen. But it, it's like, it's eight panels, retroverso, so 16 panels effectively. And it's arranged into a kind of octagonal uh, tent. Like almost. a womb-like. Yeah, like, yeah, like a womb. So you walk into the gallery and... It, as all of you know, it's an enormous space. So it's like gleaming like a jewel in the middle of that space. I walked around it mesmerized because you have those uh, stencils, which are so uh, typically distinctive of her work, but also the brushwork and these luminous colors, uh, poetry by Aga Shahid Ali and Salman Rushdie and Lal Deed, And then you sort of go inside and there's folklore and simorgs and all sorts of incredible imagery and it felt once I was inside it felt almost as intimate as the old gallery mm -hmm. like it was this tiny space and you were surrounded with art all around you you stepped out and you had the cavernous bigness of uh, Prescott Road and it was like the two spaces had come into one show mm. which uh, which felt so special <coughs> to me at that point of time but um uh, the only, the only sort of uh, memory that this book I think leaves behind is I think that it makes you think back to all the times that you have been to the gallery, which for me I think is the best thing that I can say about a local history that it makes you think of your association with it. So uh, Jerry, thank you so much for writing it. And Shireen, thank you so much for convincing him to write it and for everyone in the family for being unfiltered. Yeah. <laughs> or just uh, sort of, you know, staying the course. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should be given a medal for that. Yes, yeah, man, possibly. <laughs> possibly. I think I'd, uh, about, okay, anyway, we have to open. We do that. have to open for Q&A. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hands. Otherwise, we'll keep talking. That is not a problem. Are there any questions? There's someone who grunted. Oh, blinded as I. It, it, please raise your hand, otherwise, we will not know. Yeah. Oh, yes. Jaru over there. In the third row, yeah. I was just wondering what. You have a mic. Mike, Mike, Mike. Oh. I was just wondering what is the relationship between Keku and my father? Your father? Huh. Uh, Farooq? Mullah. Mullah. You know? Uh, you're asking me? I presume. Uh, because I, uh. Adil, do you want to answer that? Because you were older and uh, uh, you... Uh. No more. I mean, I know that my father's uh, closest friend was your father. And he truly sort of revered and loved him. And, and I know it meant a lot when he passed. But I, you know, I, I wasn't privy so much to the close relationship uh, Adil, do you remember? No, it's just that we used to go in and out of your house and you were in line. And uh, about the art part, I had no recollection. Sorry. You heard that? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got to hear it, us. Okay, another funny story I just want to uh, yes, please. relate. Um, all of the stuff that my um, family had collected for Jerry. I mean, there were piles and piles and boxes, and they were kept in my apartment on the second floor, <laughs> much to the chagrin of my servant, Ludi. 
<laughs> so every time you came and took some sum, chi, ye jeri pindo ka ye sab kachra kabi idhar se jayega. <laughs> Over there at the back. Um, uh, hi, Shireen. Chitra here. Um, Chitra. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, see, I've been coming to the... I used to go to the gallery at Jahangir Art Galleries also, and I've been coming to your uh, Kemold also, here, Prescott. Uh, I just wanted to ask, because I'm not very sure about this, uh, there, because it was public galleries, you know, I could see all types of people coming, and many of them would walk up yeah. also. Yeah. Um, I have always wondered whether this place, do you get uh, such people like wandering in, you know, students or... Mm. I've seen artists coming there, young artists or those who are going to art school and all. I'm not talking of that. I'm talking like how Jerry walked in, that type of mm. thing. So, or is it more sort of exclusive? Uh, exclusive? Yeah. yeah. That's what I want so, to ask. So, I mean, it's a very, very valid and very good question. For sure, uh, Chitra, we don't have that walk-in, you know, those droves of people that would come. Uh, from sometimes they'd get off a bus and then wander up and you know and then uh, it's like there's this amazing, very funny story in the book where uh, somebody says to Melly, uh, you know uh, uh, brown paper nahi nikala hai <laughs> <laughs> so, and the exhibition is all hung and ready and you know so you had all those kind of questions and it was and when my father moved when we moved out of Jahangir that's what he like it was brutal mm. that you know, that absence of the social nature of what Gallery Ke Mold had in the Jangir. Uh, and he really missed that interaction. Uh, so, of course, we for sure, we don't have that walk-in crowd. Um, but I think what we do have, especially over the last few years, is a completely new audience. And that audience may be not coming in and out of the gallery uh, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, but... Uh, if you come on like a like yesterday evening uh, or, or they were, you know art night thursday you may not have an opening but the audiences that have built up for art is just incredible so every gallery will have i mean even if we have two walkthroughs simultaneously both will be full so i think the audience has grown in a certain different way there are people who are coming actually for the art uh, and wanting to learn love walkthroughs uh, so that, that 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 shift is definitely there. So we do get a pre and uh, you know social media plays a huge role. So if there's a popular exhibition, we can have people coming all the time, and there'll be new people. But you know if it's not a social media happy, you know like you don't keep posting, then then the audience for for sure it dictates the audience. You, you know, know? Melly had a show there. The uh, after the week, you know, yeah. poor Melly his. Yeah, yeah. Uh, his retrospective which Shireen worked so hard on closed that, at, yeah, uh, yeah. after a few days at the NGMA. So it was moved again to, uh, to Kemold. One it young, closed because of the pandemic. Work, it yeah, closed yeah. because of the pandemic. So we opened it at... Uh, edited version came to Kemold. There was a young uh, man and his girl who came in and they, they were so delighted by the show that later they came back with red roses. Okay, like a... a like a few red roses and said, we just love this show. Thank you so much. Here are the red roses. And, you know, when we put them in the, in the vase, I looked at them and said, Melly would have said too much color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was, that's the kind, also the kind but of like response. But like Melly's show, yeah. in fact, you know, it was just post-pandemic. We reopened again with him. I mean, you know, compared to like the Melly show when he was alive mm. versus the Melly show after he died, the audiences were in, like unbelievable. Mm. It really, lots of people came. You know, there was this constant. There was this a real buzz about his exhibition in, uh, yeah. which was kind of a mini version of the of the NGMA. And I wish, I really wish you could have gone to that NGMA exhibition it because it was stunning. Yeah, it was stunning. Ranjit, Nancy, Shireen, what a job they did! It was just stunning. And then it closed in five days. That's yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there? Yes, yeah. there is a question over there. Hi. 
Hi, my question is to Jerry. Uh, how different is uh, writing a mystery thriller from uh, writing a book on a gallery? Like, any, if you can sum it up. Writing a no. uh, mystery no, no, thriller. Oh, mystery, oh, mystery thriller. thriller. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, fundamentally, I think uh, here, like in 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 a mystery thriller, you can do what you want, right? Eventually, it can be a space ray. It can be an alien. It can be uh, you know. It can be the person killed themselves and faked it all up. It can be anything. With non-fiction, with a family that you have, uh, you know, you have a trust relationship with as well, you're, you're going to work with the material that you're given. So even after, after say, a lot of the interviews were done, uh, I, you can tell that Shireen has no filters, okay? So I decided that I would do some filtering and, and keep some stories out of it. But there was not a moment that they ever said, cut this out because. So I think when you're writing nonfiction, you are bound by two records. One is the written record and the other is the spoken record. If someone says it to you and will stand by it afterwards, you can put it down in your book. That's it. If <coughs> no one says it to you, you cannot invent it yourself. You can only speculate. You can say it may have been, it might have been, it must have been. But those constructions are so clumsy that you leave them out entirely. And in a narrative like this, when I'm talking about the book, I can do any number of may have been, must have been. But this is the record. And I'm very interested in making sure that it is a totally solid record and it will not be superseded until the next 50 years have passed and another generation has taken over and a new Jerry Pinto is there to mess up the archive <laughs> <laughs> and torment them with questions. Even, you know, your question about interviewing her, we never, I never interviewed her. Like I would start talking and then suddenly just ask a question and it would be part of that, this thing and then I would go away and scribble yeah, it down. Yeah. It was quite, so, for us, because we met so much, of us, it was, it was kind of an, And also like, I mean, you know, all of them were protected by her. <laughs> so she, like the, and of course, like when, I remember 10 years, uh, no, t 8 years had passed, she wrote me a letter saying, are you interested or not? <laughs> if you're not interested, then tell me and, I, you know, we can drop it. And, and, I, and she said, oh shit. So that, you know, normally I write, I'm working on several different things yeah. uh, at the same time. But this time for that, I think it was around March that she said this. I said, Shireen, by June, I will give you a draft. Okay. I will give you a draft. Then when I put on the phone, I thought, June, are you mad? <laughs> what are you saying? And then I said, okay, June 31st is still June. Okay, June 30th is still June. So 30 days had September, April, yeah, June. 30. 30 days had yeah. June 30th is still June. And I put everything aside and I worked like madly on it. Kata -kata, kata -kata, kata -kata, kata -kata, kata -kata on it. And then finally by June 30th, I had a draft. And then the family got involved. <laughs> Three drafts later, we have Citizen Gallery, which Citizen. is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so thank you both, and thank you everyone who was here today. Thank you, Dipanjana. Thank, thank you, Dipanjana. Yeah.